Welcome to our worship here at Ridgecrest United Methodist Church in the high desert of California. I'm the Reverend Wesley Elmore, the pastor here. I'm joined by our music team of Patrick Rent on piano. David Hodgson is our singer. We have Rob Gervais on flute, Ted Fisk on guitar, and Elliot Keeter uh, playing the clarinet and other assorted instruments. We, our tech team is uh, Soshi and Amy and Monte. And I'm glad that you're joining us either on this live stream or watching this recording later on. Hopefully you can follow along with the order of worship that was sent out or else presented on the, uh, the TV screen that you can see throughout this service as well. I invite you to bow with me in prayer as we begin our time together. Let us pray. Oh God, as we enter into this day, we may not know entirely what it will bring but we trust you that you would bring your goodness, that you would reveal to us the way of faith, and that you would give us the peace and assurance that it is always so through your love. Amen. Please join in singing our opening hymn. Oh, 
full corn shall appear. Lord of harvest, grant that we wholesome, green, and pure may be. For the Lord our God shall come and shall take the harvest home. From the field shall in that day all offenses purge away. He being angels charge at last in the fire the test to cast but the fruitful ears to store in the garner evermore. Even so, Lord, quickly come, bring thy final harvest home. Gather thou thy people in, free from sorrow, free from sin. There forever purified in thy presence to abide. Come with all thine angels, come, raise the glorious harvest home. Our scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Mark in the fourth chapter, picking up in the 26th Verse going through the 34th verse. Hear the word of the Lord. He also said the kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, and then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once it goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come. He also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds of the earth. Yet when it's sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them. As they were able to hear it, he did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Here in this reading, we find that Jesus is trying to explain the the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. This is a common topic of his conversations and sayings. And so he will use parables and metaphors, illustrations, whatever it is to help his listeners know what the kingdom of God is like. Or really, what that means is what God is like. What is God's character? How does God operate? How does God view us? Mark tells us that With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. Elsewhere, Jesus would say, let those who have ears to hear, hear. Or in other words, if you're capable of listening, then you need to listen to what I'm saying. And so Jesus tried to do this. And in today's scripture passage, we have two excellent explanations around a common item. A seed is the exhibit. In each case, the seed grows into a plant. So we're going seed and crop, fruit to harvest, and they're sprinkled throughout not just these parables, but also throughout the Gospels. Now, agricultural illustrations are common with Jesus. And why not? He lived within a primarily agricultural society. On one level, the image, the lesson of the parable is the seed grows and the size of the plant and that becomes a helpful illustration to understanding God's kingdom. A seed is planted, it grows and there is a harvest. We see that growth 
And we take that growth, we take that harvest, we take and eat of the harvest. There is a beginning and there is an end. And that's a good understanding of what the kingdom of God is like. But there is something else as well. There is this in-between phase, the hidden phase, so to speak. And so we have the part of the parable which illustrates God's kingdom that speaks in the words that Jesus said, the seed would sprout and grow and he does not know how, meaning the sower or the farmer does not know how. When I lived in Hawaii, at different places, I would try my hand at planting different plants. Some were flowering plants, some were fruit and eating type plants, some were trees that had flower lay or flowers that you could use to make flower lay. And when I was successful, I would think I had a green thumb, but a lot of times I wasn't successful. In particular, I always struggled with growing papaya. Now, papaya is actually relatively easy to grow. And I had people tell me, papaya is easy to grow. And I could get to the point where I could get the papaya plant, even from seed, to, to grow in the pot for a while, maybe a foot or so, and then I would know I would need to transplant it. And every time I would transplant it, it would go for a while, and after that, it would go kaput. I could never figure out what I was doing wrong. And to my consternation, there were several instances in which I would find papaya trees, the sprouts growing up, and they would be growing in inconvenient places, in the midst of a bramble of other bushes and things. Or the one that happened a few times was where the plant was right next to the building, the house. And it, was, it would grow and it would be under the eave. Now that kind of made sense because I figured the bird sat on the, the edge of the roof and dropped the seed and that's where it grew. I can remember one time I says, well, I'll let this one grow, but I can't keep this plant here because as the trunk gets bigger. It's going to press up and be straight up against the, the, the house and that's not good for the house and then it's going to grow right underneath the, the eave of the roof and I was able to let it grow and got a, fruit, a few fruit of papaya off of it before I had to chop it down. But I can remember going, how does this work? Here I put this effort in but then on another hand, this seed just sprouts up and grows and it grows wonderfully without any of my help. And so the question is how the farmer works during the day, doing the work of the farming. A good farmer, of course, is going to know how to sow and weed and harvest and add what other supplements through fertilizer or other aspects and how to protect the plant from birds and bugs. And at night he will go and sleep and rest because his daytime work is done. But nighttime, well, that's God's work. While well, the farmer rests, while we rest, God is at work. Now the farmer can see and know how his work is done during the day, but this work of growing is a mystery. When you evaluate the seed that's placed in the ground to the harvest of the plant at the end of the season, how does it get from there to there? How does this happen? Well, we might just shrug our shoulders and go, I don't know, and maybe that's the best we can do. The harvest comes partly by the work of the farmer, but it's mostly by the work of God. It is the work we do not see, and there is a mystery here. I mean, think of today's world. How does a TV work? How does an airplane jet engine work? How does a radio work? How does a computer work? How does a truck work? How does a swamp cooler work? A furnace? An MRI machine? Now, most of us or a lot of us might have a, a kind of a general idea on many of those things, how they work, but a detailed idea, an idea to know exactly how it works and functions and does all that? No. Now, 
in preparing the sermon, I realized when I put this, that that's true in, in a lot of places, but there's an irony here for this particular town and this particular congregation and in Ridgecrest, adjacent to China Lake. Because the truth is, is that the answer to that question is, do people know how that works? Is that in this particular town and in this particular congregation, the answer is yes, there actually are a lot of people who would know how all of those things work. It's rocket science, you might say, and yes, we have people who understand that here. We could take any item, I think, that you could come up with, and there would be somebody in this town that has the know-how and the brains to know how it works, take it apart, put it back together, and repair it. But this town and this congregation is the exception to the rule. They're a rare breed, and I'm grateful for that as their pastor. Because the truth is, is that I'm one of those people that do not know how those things work. And I think a lot of people don't know that either. You know, back in the Dark Ages, after the, the demise of the, the Roman Empire, what happened was is that for a few hundred years, and one of the reasons called the Dark Ages is that civilization in a way went backwards, it didn't progress, and that there was the loss of knowledge of how things work and how things are done and how things are made and, done and put together. And so there was this period in time until finally there was a rejuvenation, the Renaissance, and then later on the Enlightenment, and then the Industrial Age, and up until our time, where progress is always being made. And so that highlights the fact that when we reach a point of time when we do not know how things work, and that becomes spread throughout, then we can suffer for it. And yet, in this desire and this ability to know how things work or happen or even exist, we can do our scientific study and our schooling and education and learn lots of things, all kinds of things. But there are some things which we are ultimately left with what this parable teaches. The seed would sprout and grow, and the farmer does not know how. I mean, think about that even in your daily life. I bet you go through your daily life utilizing so many items and doing so many things, engage with, with other items that you just assume they're going to work. And they do most of the time. In the morning, I get in my car and I put the key in the ignition and I turn the ignition and the car starts up and I drive off. It works. That's all I care about until it doesn't work and then I need to get somebody that knows how it works or doesn't work and it can fix it. So the farmer in this illustration from Jesus is trusting that God is going to be at work, that God is the behind the scenes creator of what we see are the results and what we get. And so perhaps one of the easiest things and the hardest things to accept about God's nature and God's character is the mystery of how God works. In the closing chapters of the book of Job, Job, who was suffering, who his friends come with him, and there's long speeches by his friends, and Job takes time to engage and talk, and there's this aspect of we'll question God as to why this is happening and finally in chapter 38 of Job God says I will question you Job and you shall declare to me where were you when you, when I laid the foundations of the earth tell me if you have understanding and then over the next few chapters begins this long recitation this long oratory by God in which God is questioning Job do you know where the limits are for the depths of the sea? Do you know where the, the, the storehouse, the grocery store, as it will, where snow and hail and rain are kept? Do you know where light resides, Job, God asked? Do you know about the animals and, and how they are formed and where they exist and live and all those things? God goes so far 
to say to Job, you, sp you speak of what you know not. And Job admits that. And in Proverbs, in all those collections of different wise little sayings, there's, in chapter 30 of Proverbs, there's a, a little collection of sayings that goes, three things are too wonderful for me, four I do not understand. The way of an eagle in the sky, the way of a snake on a rock, the way of a ship on the high seas, and the way of a man with a girl. I wonder, what are the boundaries, the limits of our human knowledge? The humans of Jesus' day, they would have looked up at the night sky and seen the stars and the moon, and perhaps they dreamed of being up there among the stars and on the moon. Dreams separate than the, the myths and legend that all societies have that, that take humans and creatures and identify them with stars and constellations. But did any of the humans of Jesus' day ever imagine that it would actually happen? Not until the last hundred years have humans figured out rocket science and space flight and getting to the moon, but that's what has happened. And so those people are going, well, how do you do that? How, how do you get somebody to do that? And we could go and find the people today who could explain how you create a fuel cell to, to give the boost for a rocket power and how you make a, an astronaut suit that will protect them and how you make a capsule that will protect them and shield them but can do all these things. It can be explained in how and science and learning and knowledge are amazing things. And I'm all for it. I think I'm all for it mostly. But I read this parable and I'm reminded that there are limits to what we know. A seed goes into the ground and it grows into a plant. How? How does faith happen? How does salvation happen? How does grace happen? Is there a way to construct that? I mean, is there a faith machine that we can make? Put you in and you get faith. Put something in, you get faith out. Is there a salvation capsule that we can ride through life in? Is there a grace appliance that we can use every day? How does this happen? The things of theology, the things of God... The things of faith. Does it happen because the preacher preached a fabulous sermon? Does it happen because the choir sang a moving anthem? Does it happen because the reader flipped to a particular Bible passage and read the perfect word or verse for that moment in her life? Yes, maybe, sometimes, how, I don't know, but it does. And this is what the kingdom of God is like. This is how God acts and how God is like a mystery because it shifts the work and the doing to the divine and away from the human. And any time we can understand that there is the divine at work, God at work around us or in us, then that is a good understanding of mystery, of holy mystery. And if we get stuck on having to know exactly in detail how everything happens, then I think ultimately we will end up down the road at disappointment because there is a limit, because we are not God. But here's the thing. God is okay with mystery. God is okay with human seeking and learning and knowledge and God is okay with things that are beyond what we can know and understand. But maybe the question is, is our we? And maybe that's one of the teachings of this parable. It grows and we do not know how. The Apostle Paul in his first letter to the Corinthians in that 15th chapter, the, that long section of verses that speaks of death, and resurrection and eternal life says, listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all die, but we will all be changed. He uses examples of, of seed in the ground and coming up dead and coming up new. 
He speaks of there being a physical body and then there being a spiritual body in resurrection. But it's a mystery. Mystery does not need to be something we are afraid of. As we go through life, we can grow in grace. We can build in faith. We can experience salvation. But it's also simply learning that God does things beyond our comprehension. And that's okay. But let us learn this much. How we can say, when those moments come, simply thank you for that. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you are the the giver of the seed and the growth and the harvest. And it is you that brings your understanding to us. May we take that and live it in your purpose. Amen. Thank you.
invite you to join me in a moment of prayer and reflection and to settle and still your hearts. I understand we don't have any prayer requests for our live stream, but I know that um, there are those of you watching who are in need of prayer and those that you know within our congregation and your families who are in need of prayer. And so I invite you to include them in your prayers as we go through uh, this time. And so bow with me in prayer. Let us pray. Oh God, we celebrate with you the joy and the rejoicing of occasions in which there are celebrations. So we lift up to you the two youth of our congregation whom we honored at our earlier service for their high school graduation, Lauren and Zach. We lift up to you those who celebrate birthdays or wedding anniversaries or other occasions in which they mark with joy. We come to you and we recognize that we are a people who need leaders we need leaders at our world, in our national, our state, our county, and our city level. We need leaders even within our church and religious levels. So we pray for our denomination, the United Methodist Church, and in particular, our California Pacific Annual Conference, which meets online later this week that you would be with our body that we would be the body of Christ in what we debate and consider and celebrate and do we ask that you guide all leaders those in explicitly Christian positions and those in government positions and those in the unofficial leadership positions to be people that seek the good of others and to put the, the chains and the shackles on all selfish desires. We know that it is by your love that you enrich our lives, that you bind relationships, that you teach us and lead us into being the living signs of your work and will. We believe that you have the power to heal and this power is still present. So it is in your help and name we call upon this power for those whom we bring before you, those whose bodies are racked with pain or cancer or sickness, those who are undergoing treatment, those whose minds are menaced by thoughts of worry in which wound them, those who are weary in body and spirit, and those whose weariness of the body has reached the coming end of life, that you would gently take them from this place into the place that is eternal, the home of all things that you have created in love. And so these are our prayers that we place before you, that we have spoken with words inside our mind, words from our heart or words on our lips. And we unite our prayers together as we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
This is the time in the service we speak of offering, even though we're not collecting an offering physically with you here, but I am reminded that in my experience and years as a pastor, that there is a mystery in the gifts and the offerings that the people of God do because people's hearts are changed and moved and because of that there have been some very generous gifts over the years uh, that continue from all the years that I have been privileged to minister and so thank you for that and so I pray that that mystery of God's moving in your life continues in this way and that through that you will touch other people through your gift Thank you. Let's close our worship as we sing our hymn of promise. Receive the benediction of believing hearts, the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son, and the power of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. He came singing love, he lived singing love. silence if the song is to go on we must do the singing if the song is to go on we must do the singing he came singing love he lived singing love he died singing in silence if the song is to go on we must do the singing